Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for being here on what I hope is a very lazy day, or as lazy as possible day for us. Um, we're very happy to be able to uh, share with you as a community a little bit uh, chat, chat show style. <laughs> Uh, for what we hope will be a relaxed and enjoyable session, uh, really touching the spirit of community and many of our collective memories with our teacher. Um, we are aware that uh, many of us have arrived in Plum Village at all sorts of different times. and. Uh, Today we will be hearing from some of us who arrived in the early 1980s, in the 1990s. Um, and we also want to look forward to uh, some of the life spirit of the Sangha um, currently active and looking forward maybe to the next decade or two as a beloved community. So we hope that by hearing voices from different Sangha members, we will really see the river that Sister Dinyam was talking about in her Dharma talk yesterday. And we will also get a sense of the spirit of community. Um, I think Plum Village has always been made of whoever is here. And I think Thai's teachings have also been made from whoever is here. Tai didn't create his teachings in a vacuum, but in relationship with his community. And Tai's teachings have also evolved over time, and Plum Village has evolved, the atmosphere has evolved. And so today we will uh, try to hear a little bit what some of those earlier chapters of Plum Village might have been like, and to see that evolution. And I brought with me a very, very big bag of Thai's books. And this is um, not even a quarter of them. But I hope from time to time to show you a book so you can start to see a bit how Thai's teachings evolved over time and how his insights and experiences in community and largely here in Plum Village shaped his teachings and what he was writing about at the time. Um, we have a wonderful uh, truck. We have a chance to contemplate the compost that becomes the flowers. <laughs> In uh, Sister Dinyin's talk, she mentioned uh, uh, the teachings of Master Tang Hoi. And she was saying that when Tai was in Paris, he had a chance to do research in the library there to discover the first Zen teacher who came from Vietnam and brought Zen Buddhism to China. So I just wanted to give one advertisement for this book. If you are interested in the roots of our tradition, it's really wonderful to understand how deep our roots go. Book number one, I think I'm gonna need a big pile. The title is Master Tang Hoi, First Zen Teacher in Vietnam and China. And for those of you who haven't read about Tai's years of activism and engagement in the 1960s, when Sister Dinyin was sharing about how much Tai did in such a short period of time, a lot of that is recorded in Tai's journals, Fragrant Palm Leaves. For many of us, I think it's our favorite <laughs> book by Tai, very personal. So you can discover more in this book including some very powerful experiences and moments of awakening when Tai was in the US in the early 1960s. <laughs> okay, final word. <laughs> Sister Dinyam also mentioned Zen keys. Zen keys, and in, Fren in French, uh, clé du zen, clé pour le zen, which was actually the first book published by Tai here in the West. Um, 
and it was published first in French and then in English. And it's very interesting because Tai was trying to uh, express how his kind of Zen, the, the Zen from our tradition in Vietnam, was different from other flavors of Zen from Japan or other countries. So this is a very early attempt of Tai to describe the, tra the practices he was seeking to develop and offer in, here in the West. So, that's it for the books for now. I would like to invite our bell master, Sister True Sound, Sister Kung Um, to invite Three Sounds of the Bell. And then we will welcome our first guests to the sofa, who arrived here in 1983. Consimbai, Jean-Pierre, et Colin Tue, Dylan. <laughs> We'd like to invite Jean-Pierre and Colin Tue, Codouan, to come up and sit on the wonderful uh, rustic sofa. before we start to hear some different stories. Maybe Jean-Pierre and Colin Tue, would you like to lead us in one of the first songs that you remember singing here in the Sangha when you arrived? Chasseur, <laughs> <laughs> Il n'y avait que des, euh, des poèmes, parce qu'à l'époque, c'était euh, l'exode des réfugiés, et euh, très enseigné du vietnamien aux réfugiés, donc que des poèmes d'enfance. So, on va commencer avec une chanson, donc les gens cherchent les écouteurs. Justement, à l'époque, il n'y avait pas encore de chanson du village. Okay. Il enseignait du vietnamien aux okay. enfants et puis euh, des poèmes, euh, okay. des candidats. Jean-Pierre, il en connaît une. So we will listen to a song. On va chanter ensemble. Okay. Okay. Mais je ne connais pas la chanson. <rire> Juste le début. On connaît, on s'en souvient pas. <rire> Une, je me souviens un peu. Oh, 
cha dối mẹ rằng à ôi à quá cầu rằng à ôi à quá cầu tình 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 vớt mây tình 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 vớt mây đủ rồi xe ca xe very nice very nice so in Plum Village since the very beginning Uh, there was music, and at first, uh, songs from Vietnam uh, that would be sung around Plum Village, because actually, f at the beginning, Plum Village was really a community in exile. Not only Thai in exile, but also uh, Sister Chang Kong, other monastics uh, who had fled Vietnam, and also other refugees. So many people who found themselves Uh, exiled and ended up here in France, started uh, visiting Thai at the center outside Paris. And then when that, as uh, Sister Dinyum explained yesterday, when that center became too small, then they found the land here in the southwest of France where the land was much more affordable. And in the summers, Uh, Thai was offering not just a place of spiritual refuge, but also a place of cultural refuge where the children could learn uh, Vietnamese and how to write, speak, and sing in Vietnamese, where everyone could enjoy Vietnamese food and really have a sense of home away from home. So maybe we can enjoy one sound of the bell and we try to settle so we can continue. We're sorry that the announcement wasn't made. My, our apologies. So, cher Jean-Pierre, peut-être on va commencer avec toi. Tu peux dire un petit peu comment toi tu es arrivé ici au plein milieu de nulle part, euh, au sud-ouest de la France, euh, dans cette communauté en exil. Ça s'est passé comment Et qu'est-ce que tu as trouvé en arrivant Ça s'est passé très bien. <rire> Moi j'ai connu le village grâce à la communauté vietnamienne. Euh, avec des, des, des jeunes de mon âge, des étudiants euh, à Lyon, peut-être depuis 5 ans, 6 ans avant d'arriver ici. Et euh, je me suis retrouvé à participer aux fêtes culturelles à l'accueil des boat people. Voilà. Donc, euh, pas grand-chose. J'étais le seul à avoir une voiture. Donc, c'était très pratique pour le transport des, du matériel, des vêtements, des personnes dans les foyers d'accueil. Et un jour, un ami m'a dit... Jean-Pierre, est-ce que tu veux connaître un maître zen vietnamien J'ai dit oui, super, ça m'intéresse beaucoup. Et j'avais dans l'idée que j'allais trouver un, un homme assez âgé, avec de la barbe blanche et des cheveux, comme dans les films chinois. Quoi. <rire> voilà, et... Je suis arrivé ici depuis le Cantal. Depuis, depuis le Cantal, le Cantal c'est 180 km d'ici. Et j'ai trouvé Loubès Bernac et Mérac. C'était des toutes petites routes, hein. encore plus petites que maintenant. 
Et quand je suis arrivé, je suis d'abord tombé sur les... Il y avait un, un couple qui habitait la première maison. Là. Donc je suis tombé sur le monsieur et il m'a dit « Mais non, le village des Pruniers, c'est juste là !» Mais ce n'était pas le village des Pruniers. Ça ne s'appelait pas comme ça. Il m'a dit « C'est là, les Vietnamiens, ils sont là, quelque part, derrière. » Et je suis arrivé jusque devant le bâtiment où il y a la salle de méditation, la petite salle. Et j'ai vu une dame euh, vietnamienne sortir de la maison, venir à ma rencontre. Et quand j'ai dit « Je suis Jean-Pierre », elle m'a dit « Ah, vous êtes Jean-Pierre qui accueillait les boat people ?» Alors j'ai été très surpris, oui, parce que je suis venu là comme ça. Pas de téléphone Juste l'adresse. Donc je ne préviens pas. Et euh, je ne savais pas, mais la personne qui m'a accueilli, c'était Sœur Tiankan. Elle n'était pas encore Sœur, mais c'était déjà son nom, dans l'intérêt aussi. Et voilà, ça a démarré comme ça. Et euh, pour le soir, je suis arrivé dans l'après-midi... Pour le soir, elle m'a dit, Jean-Pierre, pour la pratique, vous observez les autres et vous les imitez. Vous faites comme eux, c'est tout. Très simple. Et puis après, tout était en vietnamien. Et il n'y avait pas d'écouteur, de micro, et il n'y avait même pas quelqu'un pour me parler dans l'oreille. Mais j'avais l'habitude, depuis 5-6 ans, dans la communauté vietnamienne. On ne me traduisait pas. Je suivais le mouvement et je comprenais quand même euh, ce qu'il y avait à faire, mais personne ne me traduisait, non. Mais pour moi, ça allait très bien, parce que je pouvais m'asseoir quelque part, rester tranquille, on me donnait à manger, on me donnait à boire, tout allait très bien. <rire> Thank you. Merci Jean-Pierre. Super. Et Colin Tway, ton, arri ton arrivée ici, ça s'est passé comment pour toi mm. La même année, mais peut-être une, une approche différente. Hein? Non, non, j'ai rencontré Jean-Pierre la même année. Et euh, c'était... Euh, J'étais étudiante à l'école préparatoire... Euh, pour entrer à l'école d'infirmière et puis euh, j'avais une petite chambre chez des pasteurs et euh, en mi-chemin pour entrer depuis mon école jusqu'à ma chambre il y a une euh, petite pagode c'est plutôt un appartement et euh, c'est Shuba euh, qui était là avec Shiko Chumkin donc euh, avant de rentrer parce que les, les pasteurs ne voulaient pas que, que je cuisinais donc je passais toujours avant de rentrer chez moi prendre le souper et euh, réciter un soutre avec elle. Et un jour, Shuba Nyutung m'a dit « Tu veux devenir première en classe ?» Je dis « Mais bien sûr, Shuba. » Alors, viens avec moi. Alors, elle m'a amenée ici et j'étais émerveillée parce que je suis née à Saigon. C'est une ville cosmopolite. Je ne connais pas la campagne. Et après, je suis euh, à 14 ans, j'ai quitté Saigon pour venir à Lausanne et c'est aussi une grande ville. Et c'était la première fois que j'ai découvert la campagne. J'ai adoré. J'ai découvert les champs de tournesol, le, les champs de coq, et puis la soupe au riz avec du poids. Tout ça, je ne mangeais pas avant. Et euh, surtout, Thaï. Quand, quand je l'ai croisé, euh, c'était comme il y a un courant électrique qui traversait mon corps. Et, et euh, il n'est pas comme après, euh, quand il a pris des monastiques, il était en jeans délavé euh, et juste euh, un vacant. Just to check, we have this in translation. What was Thai wearing? <laughs> quand je l'ai croisé, il marchait depuis la grange et j'étais vers le, vers le bambou. Là, et il y avait juste deux, trois bambous et c'était de la boue, que de la boue. Il n'y avait pas d'arbres, il n'y avait pas de fleurs comme à l'époque. Et euh, très euh, s'avançait doucement avait un jeans délavé, des sabots, 
et juste le vacant, l'ensemble, le, 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 l'inside des monastiques, là. Mais je l'ai vu et j'étais, ah, ah, mais c'est lui, c'est lui. <rire> et depuis, je suis retournée deux, trois fois par année. Ça vient ma famille spirituelle, juste pour voir Thaï et puis, euh, oui, pour, pour le village, pour être à la campagne. Et assez bientôt, tu as commencé à vivre ici. À partir de quelle année euh, Ensuite, je suis retournée ici vivre trois ans avec Trey, de 86 jusqu'à 89. Et ensuite, encore une autre fois, de 96 jusqu'à 99. Et dernièrement, en 2013, Trey m'a demandé de devenir monastique. Il a insisté, il a dit, ah, oh, je deviens vieille, euh, vieux, il faut que tu, 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 tu goûtes à la vie monastique. Alors, j'ai obéi. Une bonne étudiante, merci. Et pendant cette époque, il y avait beaucoup de simplicité et même pas beaucoup d'argent. Et euh, les, tous les bâtiments, c'était très humble. Et je pense qu'il n'y avait même pas de chauffage. Est-ce que c'est vrai Pour moi, je ne sais pas. Je suis venu en été. <rire> <rire> Mais non, il n'y avait pas de chauffage. Seulement le poêle à bois dans la cuisine, c'est tout. Donc, euh, l'hiver, il faisait très froid, oui. Et d'autant plus qu'il... Euh, il n'y avait pas de chambre non plus. Les chambres, c'était juste dans le bâtiment là-bas, en bas, le long bâtiment. Euh, c'était un ancien hangar pour sécher le tabac. Juste quelques murs pour couper, et quatre briques, une planche. C'était ça le lit. Et même des fenêtres, il n'y en avait pas. Les portes, il n'y en avait pas forcément. Et c'était tout. <rire> Et alors, pour imaginer le village, euh, au début, vous prenez tout ce que vous voyez là, vous enlevez tout. Vous enlevez tout. Et vous gardez seulement là où il y a des pierres. Vous voyez encore les pierres. Vous gardez que ça. Et tout ce qui est à l'intérieur, vous l'enlevez aussi. Tout. <rire> Alors ma question est pourquoi vous, est, vous avez retourné c'est quoi qui vous a attiré si c'était si simple et si humble ici la nourriture <rire> je ne dis pas laquelle <rire> pour moi c'est plutôt ici <rire> hmm. Moi, c'est très facile. Qu'est-ce qui m'a fait revenir ici C'est la communauté vietnamienne. Je... En fait, la méditation ne m'aurait pas fait revenir ici, c'est sûr. Mais parce que quand je suis arrivé, le lendemain, Thaï est venu me voir... Hein. En fait, il y a eu deux, deux moments. Le lendemain, il est venu me voir. On n'a pas été présenté. Hein. Il est venu derrière moi. Il a mis ses mains sur mes épaules et il m'a poussé vers les enfants. Et il m'a dit, Jean-Pierre, apprenez à chanter en vietnamien avec les enfants. Comme a dit Lin j'ai obéi. <rire> et le dernier jour où j'étais là, il m'a dit... Il Venez vous asseoir avec moi devant les pruniers. Il y avait déjà les pruniers sous la route. Et il m'a demandé, qu'est-ce que vous pensez de mon village Et je lui ai dit, je pense que les gens d'ici en ont besoin et que vous aurez beaucoup de monde. Et alors, qu'est-ce qui m'a fait revenir C'est ça. Parce que, comme a dit Lin euh, Thaï ne ressemblait pas à un moine. Il avait une sorte de pantalon comme tout le monde, les sabots, juste euh, le vêtement vietnamien que vous connaissez. 
et c'est tout. Et euh, j'ai pas rencontré un moine, j'ai rencontré un homme très avec beaucoup d'humanité. Je ne sais pas comment dire mieux. <rire> j'ai ressenti profondément. Et bien sûr, il était vietnamien. Alors ça, ça comptait beaucoup. <rire> Voilà, ça a été mon moteur, hein, c'est la communauté vietnamienne. Ça, ça a été mon moteur. Pour la méditation, ça a été beaucoup plus difficile. La première semaine, j'avais mal partout. Au bout de cinq minutes, j'avais l'impression que ça faisait une heure déjà. Donc ça n'allait pas du tout. <rire> j'observais, effectivement, j'observais et j'en croyais pas mes yeux. J'ai dit, c'est impossible, je ne peux pas faire ça. Et voilà, c'est pas une chose qui m'aurait fait revenir, normalement. Merci. Hein. L'esprit de la communauté et, et voilà, la communauté vietnamienne, la richesse, la camaraderie, et la douceur, la créativité. Et Colin, toi, tu peux dire un petit peu comment ça s'est passé une journée pendant cette époque C'était le même programme qu'on apprécie aujourd'hui euh, Du tout. <rire> Euh, euh, bon, Trey voulait perpétuer la culture vietnamienne et euh, à l'époque il y avait seulement Trey et je euh, Chien Kram qui était encore laïque, on l'appelle Yitin, tante numéro 9 et Trey et Yitin faisaient tout mais euh, ils tournaient à 200 à l'heure les deux. Il faisait tout, il nous guidait, il nous enseignait comment s'asseoir le matin. Il était là, avait un bâton, il tournait en rond, et puis on s'assouplait, nous donnait une bague. <rire> comme, comme dans la tradition japonaise. On va attendre que les traducteurs ont entendu ça. <rire> le, zen, le bâton zen pour la méditation assise, super. Et après, nous avons pris le petit déjeuner, mais à vrai dire, ce n'est pas des petits déjeuners copiés comme maintenant que nous avons. Hein. C'était des biscottes que, cassées que Sir Chunkram a demandé à Leclerc, hein. des invendus. Ce n'est pas parce que Trey, avait, pas parce que Trey euh, était pauvre, mais il a toujours, toujours pensé aux autres. Il a gardé... Euh, l'argent pour aider des, euh, des écrivains, des élites du Vietnam, parce que pour lui, les élites représentent le trésor de la culture vietnamienne. Et puis chaque mois, comme ça, on emballe des petits paquets comme ça pour envoyer au Vietnam. Euh, Là-dedans, il y a des médicaments, comme ça la famille peut vendre pour élever des enfants, parce que en général... Le chef de la famille a été emprisonné par des communistes, donc euh, Thay voulait aider, mais anonymement, il ne savait pas qui était derrière tout ça. Et euh, du coup, j'étais jeune, puis j'avais très, très faim. Et puis un jour, j'ai dit à Thay, j'ai trop faim, Thay. <rire> je, je, je Parce qu'il n'y avait pas suffisamment à manger, c'est ça hum, On vivait vraiment très, très modestement, hein. Il y avait seulement une toilette, en 83, il y avait seulement une toilette et puis une douche ensemble. Pour se doucher, il faut se lever à 4 heures du matin. Et, et ben, non, mais nous, sommes, nous, nous étions très heureux d'être à côté de Thaï. On est empli de bonheur, de sérénité, de paix. Sa présence nous captivait, sa personnalité. Donc, ça revient à ce que tu as demandé tout à l'heure. Euh, quel est le motif, quel est le moteur euh, pour qu'on puisse nous, ouais, revenir ici mm. 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 Merci beaucoup. Et comme euh, Colin Tui a dit, euh, Thaï et Sir Shang Kong, ils ont dit que ce n'était pas possible de sauver tout le monde au Vietnam. Et ils ont choisi de focaliser leur énergie sur les, les personnes de culture, comme Colin Tui a dit, les écrivains, les philosophes, euh, les artistes, les intellectuels. Et grâce à ces petits euh, paquets de médicaments, qui, parce que ce n'était pas possible, bien sûr, d'envoyer de l'argent direct, ce n'était pas possible, mais de 
les médicaments, c'était l'argent caché parce qu'ils peuvent revendre les médicaments pour avoir quelque chose à manger pour leur famille. Et comme ça, ça a soutenu ces personnes qui étaient vraiment les trésors de la culture vietnamienne. Et ça fait, faisait partie de toutes les activités, on peut dire... Euh, engagé social pour le Vietnam. À cette époque, c'était principalement, principalement ça, les, les petits paquets. Parce que l'exode des réfugiés, des beaux people était vraiment très présent à l'époque. Il y avait beaucoup de, de morts dans la mer de Chine. Thaï et Chico Chengkram ont loué aussi un bateau pour sauver ces gens. Et puis ensuite, ils ne pouvaient plus continuer le travail. Ils sont revenus en France et puis ils ont acheté le... Le Ténac, là, en 82, et euh, ils ont continué à perpétuer euh, ce travail-là dans l'espoir de sauver la culture vietnamienne. Et euh, la journée se déroulait euh, comme maintenant, mais euh, euh, dans, dans la joie, dans, dans la gaieté, parce que Thaï voulait qu'on pratique dans la joie, pas dans la souffrance, même s'il y a beaucoup de souffrance qui était vraiment marquée, ancrée en nous, parce qu'à l'arrivée des communistes, il y a beaucoup de familles qui se sont éclatées, la mienne aussi, et euh, beaucoup de décès, beaucoup de, de pertes. Et Thaï et ce que tu crois, faisait tout. Thaï guidait des méditations marchées, et puis... Euh, méditation de thé, euh, des partages, et à euh, Chico Tchenkram faisait tout. Le transport, la cuisine, le shopping, et puis même euh, s'occuper des malades. Quand j'avais un refroidissement, j'ai dit, euh, je pense que je suis malade. Ah, Yitin Kaoya, Yitin Kaoya. Elle a sorti de l'huile, et puis une cuillère, puis elle m'a Kaoya. Elle, elle faisait tout, Thaï spoon aussi. massage, spoon massage. Elle et puis je, je travaillais, faisait tout. À l'époque, c'est seulement en 88 que, que Chico Cheng Kham et puis uh, Chico Cheng Duc et Chico Cheng Vé. C'était aussi une surprise pour nous. On est resté là, il y avait trois personnes qui sont restées à la maison. Avant de quitter, ils étaient laïques. Thaï les a amenés en Inde et de retour, ils étaient en robe. Mm -hmm. Et à partir seulement de ce moment-là que Thaï portait des robes longues et puis commencer à recevoir des monastiques, des, des, des disciples monastiques. Mm. On, va entendre, on a un chantôme ici, on va entendre parler de ce voyage en Inde en 88, où, euh, comme Sir Lintway a dit, euh, les premières euh, monastiques étaient ordonnées par Thaï, et c'était le début de la communauté monastique autour de Thaï. Et finalement, juste pour clôturer cette période, c'est dommage parce qu'on n'a pas cinq heures pour être ensemble. Et on va avoir quelques glimpses, quelques petits aperçus de chaque période du village pour un peu euh, préparer l'appétit, l'appétit, je ne sais pas comment dire en français, pour euh, to have a sense of appetite for how we can have more conversations. Um, et on peut avoir les échanges plus tard. Mais juste pour ter terminer ce chapitre, Jean-Pierre, c'était quoi qui a apporté, tu, tu penses, à taille le plus de bonheur et de joie Quel était son, son rêve à ce moment-là, au début Difficile à dire. Hein? <rire> euh... Si je regarde en arrière comme ça, si je regarde de taille, je le vois, je le vois clairement. Et je vois bien que son rêve, c'est que la paix puisse exister profondément. Et je vois bien que cela puisse exister en chacun de nous. C'est très clair. Euh, c'est ce qui nous a transmis. Et Linto, elle a dit, ça passait par la joie, par les chansons. Même si les chansons d'autrefois, ce pas les mêmes qu'aujourd'hui, elles racontent des choses qu'aujourd'hui on ne chante plus, mais ça fait rien. C'est... Euh, Asseyez-vous avec les enfants vietnamiens. Moi, je suis un Français. Et euh, les Français sont allés au Vietnam. Et ils n'ont pas fait que du bien, bien sûr. Mais Thaï m'a accueilli 
comme mon enfant. Parce qu'il m'a dit, asseyez-vous avec les enfants. Et euh, aujourd'hui, j'entends, c'est, j'entends pas apprenez à chanter, j'entends apprenez la paix. C'est ça que j'entends. Merci beaucoup. Merci Jean-Pierre et Colin Tway. Peut-être les fleurs pour nos frères et sœurs aînés <rire> dans la communauté. Merci beaucoup. Et j'aimerais inviter euh, Françoise et Chantum to come up to our hot seat or our cool seat for the next uh, chapter a little bit later in the 1980s. And maybe we can enjoy a sound of the bell. Thank you for being here. So maybe I'll start with Françoise, uh, in English if I may. Um, so you came a, f- a few years on, and what brought you here to Plum Village, and what did you find when you got here? Okay, I had moved in 79 to the Netherlands, and I worked for the International <laughs> Fellowship of Reconciliation, <clears throat> and the general secretary at the time was Jim Forrest. And from Jim, I learned about Thai, because Jim is the one who had spent a lot of time with Thai in the 60s, when Thai did the whole tour of the United States to talk about the war in Vietnam, the American war, as it's known there, and the need for peace, and saying, Vietnamese people do not want the war to continue, they want peace. And it's not a question of communism or, or capitalism, it's they want peace. And uh, Jim has, he passed away 10 days before Thai, actually, that's interesting. And he wrote a little book called Eyes of Compassion about all this period, which is very nice. Um, So I remember he came here in 82, actually, Jim. And when he came back, he said, or maybe in 83, uh, and he said, I've just been to Plum Village where Thai is living. I think you should go. You might enjoy it. (laughs) And in 84, we had a, a council meeting, which is an international meeting. And it was in the community of the Ark, which is not very far from here. And so we decided we needed a car to bring some material. So I said, oh, maybe we can make a little detour par Plum Village and check what it is. And so we did for three days. And that was, I was sold, (laughs) basically. I mean, Jim had already given me a version of the 14 mindfulness training the precept at the time, which began with do not in all of them. But, you know, having been brought Catholic, Catholic, it was kind of not special or specific or... Um, and so in, eight, what is in, in 89, 85, um, oh, I remember one thing also is before that, I think, we had gone with a group of friends. Thai had, had a very warm heart, and Sister Shan Kong as well, for the Netherlands, because the Dutch people were very actively supporting the peace in Vietnam. And there were a lot of people donating money for the hungry children of Vietnam, for the work of Sister Shan Kong, for all those little packets she made and sent to Vietnam. And since then, it was very important. So he came, I think, <coughs> in the early 80s, and 
Oh, pardon. Yeah, he ca uh, Ty came to the Netherlands in the early 80s, and he was invited in 85 and in 87, and he gave two retreats. And I was fortunate to be at both retreats. The first one with 20 people, second with 27, which was very special. So you were with Ty the whole time, and I came here in 85 with a friend. With the idea we wanted, we had a project with the Dutch Sangha, which was very small at the time, to rebuild the bread oven. I don't think we ever asked Thai and Shang Kong whether that was, it would be of interest to them. We thought it would be a good thing to do. You know, so <laughs> we were, my friend and I were the advanced team to destroy, to clean the whole thing and see what could be saved and what needed to be destroyed. So we arrived late in the night, found one of the old pigsty open with a sort of foam mattress, crashed on there, and the following day we came, knocked on the door, and Ty was there. And he said, oh, come on, come on. He said, I'm here taking care of Sister Shon Kong because she broke a leg. And Sister Shon Kong said, hi, she was on the floor with big, um, bags, you know, garbage bags full of medicines, and she was making these little packets. I said, oh. I said, can I help? Could I write the address? She said, no. Because the government will know immediately if it's not a Vietnamese person. And then it will be refused. She said, it, it has to be done. So she would write every address herself. Every packet would have a letter in it saying, dear sister, dear aunt, dear great aunt, dear mother, dear nephew, whatever. And they would be sent, and every packet was good for, I don't remember the exact figure, it's probably in, do you have the book? Yeah. Learning True Love? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's not by Thai, sorry. But Sister Shan Kong book is very, very good. And it helped to buy several hundred kilos of rice every little packet, and she would go and do the tour of the industrial pharmaceutical companies and ask, do you have medicine, especially heart medicine and high blood pressure medicine, which approach the cell by date because I could use them, and she would get them for a reduced price, and that would all go to Vietnam. So we did the work, but we had a wonderful week with Thai and Sister Shan Kong. At some point I was trying to cook and Thai said, no, 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 you do not cook an egg like that. And he showed me and he taught me how to make pickled mustard leaves. I'm not sure I ever tried before because it's not something you commonly find in the Netherlands. And then I stopped coming because Thai was coming to the Netherlands and we had those wonderful retreats there. And I came back later in 1990, and then all of a sudden everything was changed because it was not anymore a place for Vietnamese people to learn the culture to... Because Vietnamese refugees came from not only Europe, but also America, Canada, Australia, to be here and to help the children not lose their culture. And I remember Thai telling I will plant bamboo, and the bamboo will have to adapt. Otherwise, it will become a French bamboo, but it will be also a Vietnamese French bamboo. And he said, Buddhism is the same. It will have to take root in a new country, in a new culture. It will remain Buddhism, but it will have the flavor, another flavor. So that has always stayed with me. And I'm too long, sorry. Mm. Thank you, Francoise. And did you... Was there any practice happening at that point? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> <laughs> I was not too high on the practice. I, I can relate with Jean-Pierre. <laughs> My body hurt. I mean, I tried to sit in the half lotus. I did try the lotus once and I thought no. So I tried the half lotus and after several years realized that my knees could not take it. I remember one sitting, I don't know, I was staying at the upper hamlet because the lower hamlet was a farm, I think. I mean, they were cultivating 
uh, vegetable and things, and that's where the Vietnamese were staying. So the non-Vietnamese were staying in the upper hamlet. And I remember once sitting in one of the, I think it was, uh, what is it called there? Not Red Can the equivalent of Red Candle Hall. Transformation Hall. Transformation Hall. And looking at the little mice <laughs> crawling up and down the walls. And that was a good meditation. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember having to, Ty ask, ask me to help translate or check the translation. And we were talking about meditation marché, walking meditation. And I said, it's walking meditation in English, meditation marchante, pas marché. No, 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 that I, you say med sitting meditation in English and meditation assise in French. So I was not totally convinced, but. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Francois. So it was really the, maybe the atmosphere of mm. community, of activism, of engagement and compassion. Yeah. Yeah, and, and the person of Thai and Sister Shang Kong, that was really, who had long hair at the time. I've known Sister Shang Kong with long hair, Sister Shang Duk with long hair. So. And for you, how would you describe Thai at that point, if you had to describe his energy? Very joyful and quiet. I have a beautiful photo which I will send to you where he's sitting and looking at people, he, he was often in the hammock and on the swing. He loved the swing. And he said, I'm a child. And he always talked about being a lazy monk and uh, enjoying growing his lettuce in the hermitage. And he seemed very laid back. He was not, but yeah, there was a sort of quietness, calmness, and, and joy and, and goodness, and yeah, he entered my heart and never left. That's the thing, and that's why I keep coming back. Thank you, Francoise. Wonderful to hear. And Shantam, so you encountered Tai um, actually on one of his teaching trips in America. So Tai's first trips to America were to study at Princeton and Columbia. And then he went back to call for peace um, in 1966. And then after all his efforts in Paris to call for peace there and then building the practice centers, first outside Paris and then here, Tai continued to travel to the US to be with peace activists, to offer his teachings. And that was where you met him. Would you like to share a little bit, Shantam, about that first encounter and what came of it? <laughs> No, thank you, Mr. Hiniam, and thank you to all our Sangha for creating space. So I didn't know this. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, because how okay. much we say that we have Thai in us. So I was, I would say, a sort of lost political activist, you know, angry activist, burnt out, and then looking for a spiritual path, looking for a way of being peace. And I traveled, I was wandering, really, for five, six years, looking for a teacher who could help me. And I knew a spiritual path would help me. So I went through many traditions, starting with Hinduism, which is my own family religion. And in this process, I was ended up at the Ojai Foundation in, uh, in California. And there was a retreat being organized for somebody who nobody could pronounce the name. So we call it Kick the Can. <laughs> it is the Kick the Can retreat. So we just thought, oh yeah, there's a guy called Kick the Can coming. <laughs> anyway, and I was helping with the um, I was a volunteer, you know, living a long beard, Indian, basically I was an Indian hippie wandering around California, uh, you know, and uh, sort of, I was looking at the, I was doing the, this mic system, and I was, I looked up, and I saw this, it was like this, this 
floating. Some, somebody is floating. He was wearing brown. And I just, you know, involuntarily got up and, you know, it's my deep seeds of Indian, I bowed and he came and sat under the tree. And, and it is a teaching tree, an oak tree. And on the second day, he shared walking meditation with us. And I think for the first time, I touched peace, which is what I, I was, I was always fighting for peace and not being peace. And I think that's when he allowed me to really touch that experience of peace. And I think more than what he said, of course, he, he shared already that gatha about the mind can go in a thousand directions, you know. I touch, the, um, and with each step the flower blooms. But I think it was his presence, you know. And I remember him, there was poison oak, poison, a poison oak, a poison ivy, po and I remember him standing there and looking at it very deeply at this oak tree or poison oak. It was funny because one of the young Vietnamese women who was with him hadn't realized and had taken a cutting and had put it as, as a, like a flower arrangement and nothing had happened to her. And so it was just a, anyway, that's how we met. And when he left, he said something which is, you know, in his little, through the car and he said, help bring the Buddha, the good Buddha Dhamma back to India. So that is that koan which sat, sat is still sitting with me. Mm. And you did. <laughs> no, I've been not a very good student. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it told me many things which I never did. Uh, or I did them 10 years later or 20 years later. But you were able to organize the first trip for Tai in 1988. Or was it his first trip or his second trip? Um, no, he'd been to India before, but uh, he just finished Old Path White Clouds um, above the. <laughs> voila! <Hello. laughs> and um, he, I think he wanted to offer it to the Buddha. He wanted to offer it to the Bodhi tree. So he wanted to go back to India and on a pilgrimage. And. Um, yeah, he didn't really remember me from the from Ohio, so he asked uh, John Halifax, who had been organizing that that journey, that that pilgr that uh, retreat, and she said I was you know kosher, whatever Jewish way kosher. So then, I Sister Chung Kong rang me, and you know I used to have 22 questions for Sister Chung Kong, 24 questions, and she'd go, allow me to ask one question, and then she'd go, and I mean there was no chance to. So I think the I think the rain makes it a little bit difficult to hear. Can you can you hear still? Half half. You're breathing out. Maybe we will enjoy sitting and listening to the rain for a moment. Perhaps this shower will pass. We used to have a veranda in Plum Village called the Listening to the Rain Veranda that Tai had christened, he'd given it that name, so we can enjoy the rain for a couple of minutes in this spirit. So, dear Shantam, you were saying that trying to organize the trip in India with Sister Chang Kong on the phone, but as a nun or woman of action at the time, the phone, call, the phone calls often became very short. <laughs> when she had uh, something else to do, you just <laughs> Sister Chang Kong often would uh, hang up. I think when the rain came, 
it is a bit like feeling thighs come and passing by and the bell comes. So that's very strong. And last time I met him, I said, Thai, you know, it's, you, it's, your mark is not just the walking, it's the bell. And he went, you know, so after 35 years still, I didn't get it, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but for me, the bell is uh, very much Thai. Yeah, so Sichuan Kong and Thai came, I mean, it was a, it changed my life, really, because uh, they asked me to organize this journey for 35 days in India. And basically, Thai guided me right through. Uh, I'd, I'd been brought up in those places. I'd been as a child to both Gaia and places. But we just, you know, it was like a retreat. It was, it, it was a retreat on wheels. And at the end of the journey, we had a, actually had a retreat at a, with some Dalit Buddhists. I went to Ajanta, and at the end of the journey, he said, uh, you seem to enjoy this, it's very nice, and it's a practice the Buddha suggested, why don't you do it every year and invite people to come? So we invited Moby Ho, who translated this book, the next year, but nobody signed up, so, you know, but what, what they also did was they, I mean, well, that's another whole story, because they, he really brought, he, he brought my teaching, my teacher, the Buddha, back, to a young Indian, and Buddhism has disappeared in India for 700 years. So what he was doing is reseeding that Buddha in uh, the, the Buddhas, and Buddha is a human being, you know, that's very important for, for us and for, for our tradition. So, but he was also very keen that, uh, like on that trip, they shaved my hair. I, I used to have a beard, long hair, and you know, I was like, but on full moon night, they had my, and basically, Chiang Kong just shaved my hair. So I was sitting there. That was in Kushinagar in Lumbini. They gave me a robe. You know, I didn't get. That. That's why I say I'm not a very good student. I don't. You know, I don't. I don't. It's, it's right there, but I don't see it. I don't. A few years later, I gave the robe back. But but he was very, in a very gentle Thai way, very pushy. <laughs> but he also invited me. Sorry. And you continue. And then at the end of the journey, I mean, because I, I don't want to take out too much space, but then they, uh, he said, do this as a practice and come to Plum Village in the summer. And they were really kind. They, they paid for my ticket to come to Plum Village. And um, I arrived. Uh, I couldn't find Plum Village. It was a bit like Jean-Pierre. I mean, it, nobody, where was Plum Village? I didn't have an address. I mean, s luckily, I went to England first. And somebody from the Friends of the Western Buddhist Order had been to Plum Village. So through some network, I found, oh, that's where Plum Village is. And it is like, hmm. anyway, I found my way here. And every time, oh, no, and somebody, had, I think it was just Chiang Kong's brother or somebody, he met me at the airport and then helped me. You know, it was all family. So that was 89. And I came, it was a summer retreat. And it was basically a Vietnamese, even at that time, very much a Vietnamese cultural scene. I was very concerned about the Vietnamese young people losing their culture. And uh, so that was, and Chiang Kong said, why so late? I mean, like they expected me to come in the beginning. They were effectively giving me a scholarship to be here. And, you know, oh, okay. Anyway, so then that started, uh, yeah, that was the first time in, in 89. I think for many of us, knowing how many refugees there are in the world today is very inspiring to see the, the lengths that Thai went to to take responsibility for creating this uh, cultural refuge. And maybe this is something we can find ways to continue to support um, other communities, cultures uh, who are in need of these kind of spaces to be able to be amongst each other with our familiar food, familiar songs, um, mother language, and so on. Vishantam, I'd like to backtrack a bit to this trip in India. And uh, we heard a little bit from Colin Twe that suddenly everyone came back with shaved heads. So obviously you were one of them at the time. <laughs> but in particular, three female practitioners, Sister Chang Kong, Sister, now we know as Sister Chang Kong, Sister Chanduk, and Sister Chan V. 
Could you share a little bit about how that happened and why it happened, if you know, <laughs> where it happened? So, it is Sister Fung. You know, my brother still calls her Sister Fung. Uh, Fung. Oh, it's Sister Chang Kong. Sister Chang Kong was Sister Fung. Her name was Fung. Uh, so we, we only call her Sister Fung. And um, I, this was planned before the trip, obviously, because I was only helping facilitate this. So we arrive in the YMCA in Delhi and, you know, then move to Bodh Gaya for seven days. And then, well, Thai was very insistent we start in Sarnath. He said, that's where we should start because the Buddha gave his teachings, first teachings there. And move to Bodh Gaya. And then we get to Rajgir. Now, Vulture Peak was not special for me, but it was very special to Thai. And Thai later says, said that his Buddha eyes opened in Vulture Peak, or, you know, and this whole teaching of how we can transform our own feet into Buddha feet. So this is already pre-planned, and that story probably comes from Sister Chang Kong and Sister Annabelle and Sister Chan Bi and Tan Min, her name was. Um, but uh, one day, we Thai, before sunrise, there was the evening? I can't remember if it was morning or evening, but we, we, we used to spend the whole day. Uh, and when we were organizing the trip, Thai wanted to spend five days in Vulture Peak, uh, in, in Rajgir. Nobody understood. Nobody goes to Rajgir. For, they go for one day or half a day and come out. He wanted to spend five days. So when we were doing the planning, and, and there was no place to stay. It was horrible. It was a hotel where there were rats running around. and it's, Just to describe Vulture Peak for everyone here, it's a kind of rocky outcrop and with a valley below and hills across the valley. And it actually has a similar atmosphere, I feel, to the Upper Hamlet Ridge. So it's a small, rocky outcrop in this beautiful, lush, green valley, completely in the countryside, completely undeveloped. And this is where Thay wanted to spend time because the Buddha used to go up there to watch the sunset. Yeah. yeah it's mentioned that the Buddha loved the sunset there. Also, Mahakashapa, the first Zen master, was transmitted the, uh, the awakening by the flower sermon. But for Thay, he just, even the last time he came, he just spent the whole day in a hammock spending the enjoying himself so i think vulture peak has become a symbol of our of our community in fact after his illness i think when we had our first gathering it was called the vulture peak gathering so when the transmission took place for me it was just i was just organizing but i think that moment of seeing the uh, the hair being shaved of Chang Kong, of and you know uh, Stanabel and Tan Men, and then a few people taking the five, uh, four, 14 trainings, Ani and Therese. It was very moving because, for me, it was like, I could, it was a very moving ceremony for everyone. It was tears and just, but it was for me also it was just like a, that memory is very very strong. So each time the monastics and others come, and then Thai came again and again. Uh, every time everyone got reshaved, I remember Sister Gina being reordained in a way on, on the Vulture Peak. And it's become a tradition of Plum Village. And uh, when we talk about Plum Village, you know, 40 years of Plum Village, I don't see Plum Village only here. For me, this is my spiritual home, but I see Plum Village on Vulture Peak and, you know, and the Bay Area. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's another dimension of Plum Village. And so, yeah, I think. Um, to start the, the monastic tradition for Thai was very important. But I think for us, as lay people, he gave so much, he really, I think, put a lot of energy into us as lay people, hoping that we would come up to whatever, whatever that was. And in the beginning, you know, there was very strong uh, f sort of energy of lay people. But as the monastics started, after this first monastic uh, uh, ordination and then more, then slowly, slowly, that tradition became stronger. And that was what Thai was. Thai was a monastic. He knew that the best. And he was experimenting in the West with a lay thing, which was culturally very different for him anyway. So we, were, we used to come and go, you know. So I think... Um, I think that moment of the monastic order starting on Plum, on Vulture Peak is very important for our history because when I see this 300 years from now, 
I see that's, I, I, for me, it's clear it's a fourfold Sangha. That's the charter of the Tipian. That's the revolution of Thai, is the fourfold Sangha. I mean, the Buddha said it too, mm -hmm. but it's not just Thai, but it's very much, uh, so I think he's always encouraged us in that way. Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't know whether that's one answer, but it's not the, yeah, it's just, when you watch the sunset, you know, you're watching the sunset like the Buddha watched and Thai watched. And when you sit there, for me, it's always in the footsteps of Thai. It's not, I call it footsteps of Buddha, but I can see Thai everywhere when I go on pilgrimage. You know, where he sat, I mean, I, and I work out where Buddha would have sat, but I know where Thai sat. And where Thai, you know, had his, which rock he sat under and how, you know. It's so, he's imprinted in India and he's a child in India. You should see some photographs. Actually, I brought a photograph of him in India. Uh, it's in your dining room, that one which is with the mic, with the broken mic, I think. He's like a, he was like a little child, like meeting his teacher. And his eyes would light up. Uh, you know, each place, he was like, uh, so I think here he was a bit of a sage, you know. After a while, everyone saw him. But there he was, even when he came last time, he was like a young boy meeting his own teacher. Yeah. Thank you, Shantim. And Tai would always say he was so proud of the book, Old Path, White Clouds, because he felt he was able to give, give back the Buddha his humanity. And so um, through Tai's studies, through his time researching in the libraries, and through Tai's own practice and being in community, it became so important for him that the Buddha is not a god, but is really a human being. And I think what all our speakers have shared so far is Tai's own humanity and Tai's own humility and joy that really came through. Thank you, dear Françoise and Chantum. We have, I have to be a little bit vigilant with the time. So these are just taster uh, words. Uh, thank you for sharing your hearts and your experience with us. So we would like to offer you our flowers of gratitude and the conversations can continue as the retreat continues. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so from this period of Thai, we have books like The Sun, My Heart, which is a very deep book and also the favorite of many of the monastics. If you haven't read this one, this is a wonderful book. And then we have uh, Being Peace, and really the theme of peace in Thai's writings. So we would like to invite our next uh, ones to come up. First of all, we will start with Sister Gina and Steffi, and then we would like to invite Sister Biniam and Bettina to join you. So, dear Sako, sin moi. So around the time that... Uh, uh, Sister Gina was coming and Steffi was coming in the very early 1990s, as we, as we will hear. Tai was really beginning to teach about the Sutra on the Full Awareness of Breathing. So his first commentary on this is called Breathe, You Are Alive. And uh, it went on towards the end of the 1990s. Tai then offered a 21-day retreat on the 16 exercises of mindful breathing in Vermont in the US. And that book is called The Path of Emancipation. So you get a sense of the, sorry. Florida. Oh, sorry, this was in Florida. So uh, you get it in Key West. So you get a sense of the, uh, the ripening of Thai's teachings about breathing. But maybe we would like to hear a little bit how Sister Gina appeared in Plum Village. <laughs> How did this happen? And Sister Gina was already a monastic at this time in the Japanese Soto tradition. So, dear Soko, how, how did you get here? Part of the way on foot. Not by choice, though. <laughs> um, 
So I want, yeah. And which year was it? Yeah. Thank you. 19, the first 21 day retreat in June. Uh, 1990, 1990, yeah. So, yes. Um, so I was already ordained in the Japanese tradition. And after three years in a Japanese temple, Soto School in Japan, um, I had a great need to study the Dharma more because my Japanese was not enough, not good enough to follow all the teachings that were given, of course, in Japanese. Uh, so I came to the West and somewhere in one of, I visited certain centers and in one of the centers I found a magazine called The Mindfulness Bell, number one. <laughs> hmm. Yes. And I opened it, read it, and I thought that's where I want to go. And in it, it was the announcement in a three week retreat. Uh, what was it? Buddhist psychology, I think, Buddhist psychology, in this place called Plum Village, Meyrac, France. Yeah. So <laughs> I registered, and um, I knew Aimé, so I, I looked up and somehow I figured out, can't remember how, that it was near Aimé, which is not very far from here. So I thought, okay, I'll just go to Aimé, and then I'll, I'll go to this place called Meyrac. So I fly in Bordeaux, take a train, you know, end up in MA, and then um, realized there was no way, there was no transportation, direction Merak. So I looked in the telephone book, and I, I looked for Plum Village, Plum Village, Plum Village, and no Plum Village. So I, then I looked at every entry, and I, then I found um, Buddhist Unifié uh, something, something, something. Huh? So the Unified Buddhist Church or something in French, and I thought, well, I'll try that one. There can't be many Buddhist centers. It, it may just be that one. So I called, and um, a friendly lady, a lady's voice, let's put it that way, answered the phone, answered. And I said, well, you know, I'm on my way to Plum Village, and I am in Aimé, and how do I get to where you are? And she said, well, you're not supposed to be there. We only go to Saint Foy, and I thought, I don't know where Saint Foy is. <laughs> so she said, Sorry, we have no car available. So I said, Don't worry, I'll walk. And then she said, Well, as soon as a car comes back, we sent it your way. I said, Oh, compassion. <laughs> and it was a very hot day. I had a backpack, not too big. And I was started to walk. And sometimes I get migraine when I haven't had enough to drink and it's very hot. And I developed a migraine as I walked. And every time I put my foot down, it went <laughs> in my head. <laughs> so I walked very carefully. I mean, you know, the way I put my foot on the earth and I walked. You know. um, and then at a certain point I came to a tree and I thought, I have to sit down. It's very hot. And I sat down. And then a little beaten up uh, cream... Uh, Renault 4, eh, French car, arrived, and uh, somebody opened the window and said, you must be Sister, G Sister Gina. I thought, oh, saved. <laughs> 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 so they turned around and then uh, drove me to the lower hamlet here. I was welcomed by a uh, Western sister. Uh, and then we uh, walked to, um, to a room I was going to stay or something. And she said, um, I have to follow my breathing when I'm walking. And I thought, does she have a migraine too? <laughs> <laughs> it was Sister Annabelle who welcomed me. So she <laughs> a very, very uh, diligent um, uh, and very kind uh, sister, as I got to know her. I mean, I, I am, how do I say this? I perceived her as a very kind and, and diligent sister, and I thought, oh, she's going to be a role model for me. Um, yes, so that was my arrival here. And then towards the end of the 21-day retreat... Uh, Could you share a little bit about that retreat, Sikor? Yes. Was it, can you rem what was Thai teaching? Was, and how did Thai seem when you met him? Because this would have been the first time you met him in person. Yes. Um, so 
I was very impressed. I wondered whether this teacher was touching the earth at all. <laughs> it seemed to be floating just above the earth. Um, and what really struck me was that Thai was speaking um, using a very simple language for a very deep teaching. And I realized I understand the words and I need to be careful not to think because I understand the words, I have realized it. And that there is a, a life of practice and looking deeply and things behind those words. Mm. So that was my, my, my um, uh, first impression. Uh, and a lot of gratefulness you know, for a teacher like Thai able to, to teach in that way. And this would have been one of Thai's first retreats in English as well. Yes, of course, that I wasn't aware of. <laughs> <laughs> Here in Plum Village. Here in Plum Village, yes. Uh, it was the first uh, retreat in English and the first 21-day retreat. Um, and many, many uh, people who've been here before, many from different traditions also. Uh, the Japanese Soto tradition, Rinzai, uh, many, many different tr traditions came together here to study with Thai. Uh, that also made me look, ah, because I only knew the Soto tradition and only the Japanese, from Japanese. So I thought, well, this teacher offers something, obviously, that um, many people are looking for. And I, I don't mean to say all then to step over to to, uh, to the Plum Village tradition, but to deepen or understand their own tradition they were in better. Yeah. And so what struck you about the atmosphere that you found here then in 1990? Mm -hmm. what, what was, I mean, obviously we've heard the buildings were very, very simple. It does not look like a Japanese Zen temple. <laughs> And what else struck you about the atmosphere here, and what was different, but also still Zen? Yes. Um, it was the most diverse group I'd encounter on retreats. Um, and the atmosphere was one of, I would not have called it at that time, but sister and brotherhood, a family, you know? Yeah. Although from very different uh, traditions, uh, different nationalities, I've never been to a, a retreat with so many different nationalities, although the Americans were, I think, very well represented. Hmm? Shantam was there. I thought, oh, India is here too. <laughs> is that, oh, India is here too. Uh, yes, I was very, very impressed by um, the diversity because I had not seen that before anywhere else. Yeah. And so you left after the 21-day retreat? No. <laughs> In fact, I never left. <laughs> um, I, I had lived my life um, moving from country to country. I lived in 11 countries out of my own choice, not because of jobs or things like that. So towards the end of the 30 uh, the three-week retreat, uh, one of the uh, um, sisters who lived there approached me and said, Thay said we should invite you to stay indefinitely. I thought, That's, that word is not in my dictionary. <laughs> but we'll see. So that was in 1990. I'm getting me close to indefinitely. <laughs> I'm still here, quite close. I'm still here, and that is because... Um, It is always new in some way or another. Or maybe I have learned through Thai's teaching to look at all. That it's always new, it's never the same. It's the impermanence, maybe, and the non-self. I think those, th that teaching really um, yeah, spoke to me and speaks to me. And is really expressed in the Sangha that continues to evolve depending who is here and uh, 
how the atmosphere is changed by the people that are here. And so I think at the beginning of your era, there were then the summer retreats that were more international, with international guests coming to the upper hamlet? Yes, right. And the Vietnamese guests were in the lower hamlet. Yeah. And so I think that was one of the few times when nuns were living in the upper hamlet. <laughs> And then so hosting a very international, diverse community uh, up in the Upper Hamlet. So then the two rivers, we start to get the sense of different rivers coming into the community and that international river maybe growing every summer. Yes. Um, and it has grown a lot, that river. Um, and also, uh, when, when you all arrived, I think I said, and I saw all of you, I thought, Thai is so happy. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, because um, I don't think there's one person who can continue Thai, but as a Sangha, we can continue Thai. And, and I also see the Sangha as the most precious gift that Thai has offered us. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I'm very grateful. So uh, uh, Thai is very happy, as I was, very happy to see all of you here. <laughs> Thank you, dear Sukho. So we have Steffi here sitting next to you. And Steffi, you arrived at a similar time. And would you like to share what kind of community you found in which year you came? Yes, it's, um, I just can uh, relate to the, to the Sangha. Because Margaret and I, we arrived in the first time in uh, September '93, and we just came here for one week, and uh, it was in September. And Ty was on a long tour in America, so Ty was not even here. And what we encountered was a beautiful sangha, and even Sister Gina was not here because it was in America, um, and. I remember the the moment we arrived. Um, Helga from Germany. She was sitting in front of the personal building where she was living together with her husband uh, Karl, and she was very friendly and she received us very openly. and And it was a small sangha. And I remember as well when we we did a, we got an introduction for walking meditation by Sister Eleni. He, she now lives in uh, New Hamlet, and we were with the three of us, just Sister Eleni, Margaret, and I, and she was teaching us how to do walking meditation, and we walked through the forest, and then in the middle of the so forest, we stopped there, and we sang the song, uh, Being an Island Unto Myself, and then I fall in love um, completely with Plum Village after the first Dhamma sharing, a thing which really really touched my heart was that we bow to each other. That was really a completely new experience to sit in a group and that someone really was deeply listening to me. And Margaret and I, we, by that time, we lived in a community in Holland and we had a quite a challenging community life there and not so well listening to each other. And we came to Plum Village be because we read an article in a Dutch newspaper and the title was The Village of Peace in France. And we thought, oh, that sounds good. We really need peace. So, and then after this one week, we decided this is a good place. We want to stay here longer. We want to be a permanent resident of Plum Village. And so we organized our lives and we came back in the following year, March 94, and we stayed on then for two years, being part of the, of the resident community of Plum Village. Mm. And uh, so at this time, Thai, the community was very small, just maybe a couple of dozen guests and a couple of dozen monastics. And I think you were sharing earlier that everyone could fit in the small red candle hall for Dharma talks or for meditations and so on. And would you like to share a little bit how Thai was teaching you at that time? And uh, something I would love to hear about what happened one day when you went to the upper hamlet for a day of mindfulness and something unexpected unfolded. <laughs> oh, yes, something very unexpected uh, unfolded. Um, 
it was at the end of the winter retreat, and um, I think it was the winter retreat uh, 90, at the end of 90, 94, 95. And, and Tayyad asked us during the winter retreat very often, please write letters. I would like to know how the practice is going, I need your feedback, I need your feedback from my talks. And um, he asked us several times. And then, quite at the end of the winter retreat, we came up to the upper hamlet, and the talk would take in the small transformation hall, so not in the big hall. So you can imagine that big was the winter retreat, so we all fitted in, in the transformation hall. And then we entered the hall, and it was a completely different setup. All, no cushions, only tables with chairs, like in a school. And Thai no, it was it was an upper hamlet, Margaret. <laughs> you would like to come sit next to me? <laughs> okay, it was an upper hamlet. And Ty, he was already in the room. And on each table, there was a stack of paper with a Plum Village um, mark on it. Very official, you know. And Ty was looking very seriously, and he said, so, examination today. <laughs> and, and then we all sat at the table, it's a little bit, uh, uh, said, okay, this is a final examination after the winter retreat. You have to sit down, and then you write this examination, take out your pencil. He was really like a very, very uh, serious teacher. And then we sat down and he wrote 10 questions on the whiteboard. You know, the first was, how is your sitting meditation? How is your walking meditation? How is your eating meditation? How do you practice with strong emotions? Uh, have you practiced uh, uh, beginning in you? Are you in harmony with the Sangha? So 10 questions. And we said, uh, oh, <laughs> you really could feel a very dense uh, energy. And then on a, on a sudden, he turned around and with this really big smile, he smiled at us and he said, so, uh, you haven't uh, wrote me a letter. I have not received enough letters. So this is now my way. I need some feedback because my teachings depend very much on what you are sharing with me. And so let's enjoy writing this letter to me and then he smiled, and uh, all in a sudden, this energy of of very, very being very serious with just one smile and one sentence, he dissolved it, and you, you just could see that Ty had a lot of um, fun uh, by himself to have uh, put us first in this place, and then giving us this relaxation. And and you did all have to do, then sit there and actually do it. Yes, we did it all, and and then and it took two hours or even three hours to answer all these questions, and then and then in the next uh, Dhamma talks he kind of uh, gave us a feedback on what we had written, and I know one friend she had written on the question, how is your eating meditation? She wrote, my eating meditation is good. And then <laughs> I said in the summer talk, okay, listen, this is not enough. You can write that the, that the food is good and delicious, but only writing my eating meditation is good. That's not enough reflection. <laughs> so this is so wonderful because we really get the sense of a teacher really wanting to develop the practices and the way to train his students. And so you're part of the kind of laboratory of teachings and practices as Tai was developing all of the Dharma doors that he was in the 1990s. The particular way of walking meditation here in Plum Village, the particular way of offering guided meditation, which is one of the things that Tai has really offered the West and didn't exist in the West before Tai started to create these ways to combine key phrases with the breathing. And of course, a relaxed way of eating meditation that's not as rigid as in many Buddhist traditions and so on. So, and I think Tai was at this point also very excited in all the communication practices around deep listening, loving speech, um, beginning anew, and also the peace treaty. 
So I would like to invite Bettina and Sister Binyam also, if Sister Binyam, you're still here, wonderful, to come up. Uh, we can have, um, maybe could someone help bring one more chair, would be wonderful. Can we squeeze three in the sofa? Can we be cozy in the sofa? <laughs> Bettina, do you think you can fit in? Very intimate sisterhood. We manage you can manage, okay, wonderful. get the sense of the sisterhood spirit from the 1990s in Lower Hamlet. <laughs> so, uh, Sister Binyam, would you like to share a bit about your arrival here to Lower Hamlet and what community did you find in which year? Well, I first arrived in 1993 as a lay person in the Upper Hamlet in summer retreat. And it was a very, very beautiful experience. I fell in love with Bl I fell in love with Plum Village right away. I had met Thai already in Germany on a retreat that spring and I fell in love with it there already, but then with the community here again. Here yeah, I just already when I met Thai just from I don't know, five-day retreat, I think it was. I felt I want to be a nun, and I can't be. What is a nun? You don't even know what a nun is. You don't. You can't say that, but it was in me, and I came here, and I, wow. The, free, the freedom, the peace, peace as freedom, not freedom doing crazy things, but the peace here, and also sort of away from civilization in a good way, sort of not the stress and you have to like this and you have to do this, but to live from the inside was very, very, very important to me. I uh, didn't become a nun right away because I didn't trust myself with this inner voice for a while, but I came back regularly to Plum Village and to Thai at that time came to Germany every year, so I came to a retreat with Thai. And this deepened my practice, my love for Thai, for Plum Village. I had my own little Sangha at home, and at some point I knew, yes, I really want and I can trust that I want to be a nun. And was in well, it had to with my mother, who was old and sick. I decided to stay with her and let go of that dream for the moment. But oh, it really developed or became stronger that I really trusted it well, while I was with my mother. Before it was a wish, a dream, but then it was, yes, that's what I want to. After my mother died, I came to Plum Village in December '96. And there we had just bought, or Plum Village had just bought the new hamlet. I've been used to the upper hamlet and the west hamlet. And I almost stayed in the west hamlet, but everything was in the upper hamlet, under the linden tree. And then uh, I was in the new hamlet. That year was the first year of the new hamlet. And no lay friends were allowed that time because uh, the nuns should first, nuns before were in the lower hamlet, should sort of find their, their uh, find together again in this new place. And well, there were lots of things to do. Also have one, one not just a winter retreat, sort of one year, nearly a few months there in the new hamlet just being on their own to 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 become the new Hamlet Sangha. And uh, that was very good for me. I could really be with the nuns right away. Otherwise, I would have been with the lay friends and somewhere the nuns, but so I could be there from the beginning. Mm. So the, the dawn of having of some uh, Plum Village expansion um, because I think there was, um, Plum Village was a little bit illegal at the beginning. <laughs> I think the paperwork in France was quite complicated. 
And I think in the summer retreat of 2005-06, suddenly um, I think Lower Hamlet was shut down. And that is the origin to why New Hamlet was bought, because they had hundreds of people. We heard those numbers from Sister Dinyam, hundreds of people coming for the summer retreat, and it was illegal to have it here. And there was an old, uh, I think it was some kind of children's home that was up for sale, and they managed to find a donor to buy New Hamlet so they could still have a summer retreat. <laughs> so it was a last minute purchase, and that's the origin. And then uh, they took that opportunity of having different environments to then create a monastic environment there in the New Hamlet. And Sister Beanium, as an aspirant to be, was able to join that atmosphere. And then here in the Lower Hamlet, it became a lay community for a couple of years. And so, Bettina, I wonder if you would like to share a little bit about the effect of that here in the Lower Hamlet. Um, so when the new Hamlet was bought and all the sisters of Lower Hamlet has been invited to move to New Hamlet, the Lower Hamlet was... Um, place where um, we could um, live together as a lay community for up to I think nearly two years, 98. And there have been a, a German Dame teacher couple, Karl and Helga Riedel, who now are with the Intersein Sangha in Germany, Intersein Center, and a Vietnamese Dame teacher couple An Huang Tin Chui, now Fab Lu and Sister Queen Yem, and also Duan and Anduk have been there. Mm -hmm. And we, yes, the daughter, and some other friends. And so we've, we were suddenly um, yeah, in this situation to run the hamlet. And it was a wonderful time because we felt a lot of trust from the community from Thai to really make that possible and it was really wonderful to do and yeah on all levels work together as a sangha and we had guests it was a normal life like in all the other hamlets with the two days of mindfulness and in the beginning very exciting uh, the first uh, mindfulness day the first christmas festival and all that And uh, it was a day of a lot of a time of a lot of learning and coming together and yeah, giving a lot of empowerment and also beautifully in this time being together with the monastic community on these days. And uh, Thai was often coming on lazy days around, resting a little bit in his room and walking around and asking us when he met us, uh, are you lazy enough? <laughs> <laughs> And we felt really uh, good taken care by him, by this question and showing up. And yeah, also, like you said, the community was so small in this time and we had not uh, access to Thai as not monastics, but he was somehow, he was very present and available and walking around and a little here, there and a little how it's going there and um, yeah, he even visited us on the uh, chat visiting room saying he was climbing up persimmon up there and so it was a wonderful, wonderful time this period. And what would you feel with the kind of em the place the teaching that Tai was highlighting most at this time? What mm. was he speaking about in the talks? What was he guiding you all on? I guess it's very, very, very personal, of course, what I choose to say now. <laughs> um, I think in these years there have been a lot of these basic practices like the Sutra Anapanasati and a lot of living in harmony together and We were not asked to have a test, but we got sometimes homeworks, I remember, in these years. Like writing about, what did you do when you had a crisis? Did you really take refuge into the Buddha in you and the Sangha? Or did you start to judge and do all these things, so this kind? And um, 
for me, it's it's the most I think through all these years of this big treasure of Thai's teachings to embody, always inviting us to embody what he was talking about, like to really then practice beginning a you or to really breathe when you are excited. And so, um, yeah, I feel the very basic living in the moment, um, living the teachings. And also, I felt a lot of um, um, relaxation. You know this, are you lazy enough? It's for me also a sentence of this time, of uh, really, we had a lot to do, of course, with the Hamlet, but the main thing was, how is the energy you are doing things? Always coming back to what is your energy and how is your being, and then to move out and do your activities. I felt somehow it was very fundamental, very basic, very grounding. A good, uh, a good um, memory to have, <laughs> the art of being peace, and also while in action. And uh, Sister Binyam, do you have similar memories of this time? What struck you most about this special period in the 1990s? Well, after one year, I came to the lower hamlet. Sister Gina had been come the abbess, and uh, it was no longer Le Le hamlet then. Was it two years from all I know? It was 98, probably. And then uh, there were only 12 there. I think they started with eight, and then four of us came down, came from New Hamlet here. And we were 12, and summer retreat people came. It was fall here, and 12 of us had to do several things, not just pot washing, but this and that and that. But I loved it very much. It was very beautiful for me. When you asked... Bettina, what was the teaching there? All of a sudden it popped up to me. I mean, Thai, I can't say. I remember that when I came as an aspirant the first two winters, Thai was teaching the sutras. That, I know, he just took the chanting book and, <laughs> and taught sutra after sutra. And I remember that sometimes somewhere in the middle of the sutra teaching, he said, talked about sister so-and-so doing this and that. He always, his teaching was very personal. He never just taught a sutra, but he explained then with the problem of a sister. It was very, very applied <laughs> sutra. That I know ties, uh, it never, we should never just study the sutras, uh, any texts, if they don't apply to our life. If we don't practice it, there's no sense in knowing them. And when you asked, Bettina came up in me that at that time, Thai was sort of, uh, for a while, advancing the idea that every, not just every country, but every big city, should have a mindfulness practice center without monastics, just lay people. And uh, that's when Karl Schmidt brought, asked Karl and Helga to leave Plum Village to come, and uh, he bought Intersign Center in Germany, and they are to this day uh, the, the Dharma teachers of Intersign. That was, they left here, I think, 2000. I'm not totally sure, 90. I ordained uh, in February 98. I think they le might have left 99. And uh, I think worldwide it's the only one that at least that stayed longer. But that was a big thing for Thai at that time. Mm. So Thai is sort of developing the practices here in the community context and setting of Plum Village, and then really inviting everyone to experiment back in their hometowns and cities. And I think the 1990s was also a period when a lot of sanghas started all over Europe and all over the US. So it was around this time that Thay was teaching the heart of the Buddha's teachings. So from his research, the elements that he felt were the most important for all his students to understand, 
and this remains on Amazon, one of the best-selling <laughs> Buddhist <laughs> books in the, in the English language. And uh, it was around this time we have the book uh, Touching Peace, The Art of Mindful Living uh, in Community. Uh, the book of the poems, the gattas that you see posted around in the bathrooms and the bedrooms. These are translated uh, from the tradition and then really applied here in Plum Village. This book is called Present Moment, Wonderful Moment. And there's a new edition of that uh, out now. And Thai's kind of number one uh, book next to the miracle of mindfulness, Peace is Every Step, also came out at this time. So there was really, with the presence of the community around Thai, he's really exploring what would a community of peace look like and what would practices of peace look like. So I think we're halfway through the books. <laughs> We wish we would have more time. I have two more sofas of people I would love just to, to bring up here, and I hope we can get through everyone by dinner. So thank you so much uh, to our sisters, uh, lay and monastic from the 1990s. Thank you so much. And I would like, thank you, yes, flowers and gratitude for you all being here. Thank you. So I would like to invite uh, Lisa, Renika, and Jassy to come up. So we will fast forward a little bit uh, through the 2000s, um, and we will uh, look at some of the ways that Thai's engagement and socially engaged Buddhism, applied Buddhism, uh, has expressed itself. We will be cozy on the sofa. This is an intimate sisterhood sofa. <laughs> Maybe we can listen to a sound of the bell to... Uh, refresh our hearts and our breathing and arrive into this uh, precious moment. So before this panel started, I said it will be a challenge with the time. You'll have at least three minutes, maybe four or five, but I think we're down to three. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, Lisa, you are from Jerusalem, and uh, you first encountered Tai. I, I'm not sure whether it was when he came to Israel, um, but if you would like to share a bit about his um, powerful trip to Israel in, I believe, 1997, and the impact that had. Uh... Thank you, dear Thai, dear Sangha. Uh, it was uh, remarkable, 1997. He must have touched thousands of people in it throughout Israel. We had a, a five-day retreat, silent retreat. It was really incredible to have a thousand silent Jews <laughs> for five days. <laughs> Um, and as a result of his visit, oh my goodness, dozens of sanghas sprang out, sprung up all over all over Israel, and practice very dedicated practices started all over the country. And that was 1997, and at the time I was a war correspondent for the Boston Globe, working in Jerusalem, and I had covered many suicide bombings, and. Months before they arrived, one of the suicide bombings ended up with me feeling incredible love for this suicide bomber. And I didn't understand why. And when I met Tai and Sister Chen Kong, Sister Chen Kong explained to me that my heart had discovered its Buddha nature. So that was a revolution in my life. And from then on, I... I left journalism and I became a peace activist. And um, I helped to found a peace academy in a Palestinian school in, in East Jerusalem, which was a really remarkable experience and, and time. 
And then Sister Lugnim and Brother Fap Lai and a few other monastics came to do a day of mindfulness with us in the school. And then I saw what teaching really was. And I saw how the kids who normally turned the classroom upside down were turned upside down themselves in a really good way. And I realized that's what I want to do. I want to, I want to work with mindfulness. With, with, they worked with all ages. It was, it was a drastic change from the way the school normally was. And so I brought a team of Palestinian, of my students here to a wake-up retreat a couple of years ago. Before, before the pandemic hit, and that was, that was it. That was so remarkable. The first thing is Palestinians are very much, I think, like the Vietnamese. They only want their own cooking. So they took over the kitchen and they cooked for 500 young people from around the globe. And they were received with such warmth. Um, the monastics were so lovely, they, they set up our dinner underneath the trees, the Thai planted on Upper Hamlet, and they had the musicians playing classical music, and we ate makluba, it's called upside down. We ate it in silence, listening to this music, and it was, it was this massive prayer for Palestine and for everybody. And then at the end of the wake up retreat, our Palestinian youngsters uh, were gonna dance their, their debka, their, their national dance, but none of them could dance, you know. So they stood there and they heard the music and they had the rhythm in them, but they couldn't, they couldn't quite get the steps out. And so 500 young people from around the globe rushed the stage and jumped up and down shouting, free, free Palestine, free. We, you know, we, we can't change the world, but we can change the world, but we can dance for you. Thank you, Lisa, for this uh, beautiful testimony. And Thai, um, as some of you may know, in 2003 hosted an incredible encounter uh, with um, people from both Palestine and from Israel, practicing deeply together for two weeks, uh, first separately, and then after about a week or 10 days of practice, creating moments for the groups um, to be able to speak to one another of their own suffering. And I think a lot of the uh, sort of interventions that Thai has made at the international level around how dialogue is possible between warring parties comes from Thai's work of compassion with the Israelis and Palestinians. And Lisa's continuing to work to bring more Palestinians here every year and uh, also coming this summer. So this is one way in which Thai's uh, peace work uh, is continuing. And we're very happy to support you in that, Lisa. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, dear Renika, you would like to start about your, share your journey, um, which I guess both your personal journey and then how your own practice has expressed itself in engaged uh, action within the Sangha and beyond. Thank you. Um, the Thai, the beloved community. Um, so this is a journey really that um, started with both of us. So it's really a journey of um, both of our um, beginning of what I'm going to say. And it started at Plum Village 2004. And actually, I remember the conflict resolution that happened. And uh, 2004 was like an exploration to, oh, m meditation. Yes, I've heard of meditation. It's, it's part of my culture, but I'm not quite sure what that means. Because it was kind of lost because I was I grew up in England and there was not a lot of meditation going on there. Um, and the things that I did understand was um, was kind of a bit mystic. So I didn't really understand any of it. So then I went in search for what meditation was and it's what brought me to Plum Village. And um, on that year, I also um, recognized that there wasn't many teachers that were not like from the East in the West. And so that was kind of my personal journey really to kind of explore that side of uh, practice and Thich Nhat Hanh really did speak to me in many ways. Um, and so did a lot of the monastics. And one of the monastics I'd like to mention is Sister Jewel, Kyra Jewel. Um, she's now derobed and she's doing a lot of the uh, practice and teachings out in the uh, US. 
And she was kind of like a mentor to me in a way that she really, uh, which she kind of, she had an eye on, 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 on people like me, <laughs> let's put it this way. And she asked, she invited me to kind of speak about my practice and my trainings, one of the five mindfulness trainings in the UK. And it's not something I do, it's, this is really not me, I do not do big presentations, I'm pretty shy. Um, but it was, it was an opportunity to recognise that this wasn't just me speaking, it was for my ancestors and for the future generations like me, who don't have access to this practice. Um, so that was my vision back in 2004, three and four. And, um, there was many barriers, really. I mean, I'm going to go on and talk about the heart of London Sangha. Is that OK? <laughs> Time, okay. <laughs> well, I'll just quickly say that um, Natasha was part of our Sangha at, in London, Heart of London, at uh, Heart of London Sangha, known as Natasha then, and we were very excited that she was going to become a monastic, and we've, we we uh, bid her farewell, and here she is. And um, part of that um, entering the Sangha in London was not diverse, believe it or not, even though London is a very diverse city, it wasn't very diverse at all. And it didn't feel like um, a home. It wasn't a home for me. And the, one of the Dharma seals as we've heard is, I am home, I have arrived. And so I really wanted to create that in the Sangha. So it took um, quite a lot of efforts and a lot of stops and starts and I, I found a friend that was able to do that with me. So I'm going to pass it on to Jessie if we've run out of time. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, um, we met at that retreat in 2004 here and actually at that retreat was one of the retreats where um, a Palestinians and Israelis were invited to come and practice together. And I remember I knew nothing about Plum Village and I saw that happening and I thought, ah, okay, this is what I want. I want something that's engaged with the world that can give me a path. And yes, we met here. And um, I think that um, something that happened for me is that I had enough for various causes and conditions. I had just enough awareness to realize what a, what a challenge it would be um, to be in the Sangha. Um, as such a um, minority in that environment. And, um, and me and Renika just clicked and we became very good friends. And um, she has built the Colours of Compassion Sangha in, in the UK and in the, in the heart of London to really make a home. And it's been a long journey where we, we had many times of coming together not just us, but us and others, slowly, slowly, slowly and organically to build friendships and, and to um, build both awareness um, with, the, with the white people in the Sangha and just to slowly build that. And I know we haven't got time to tell the whole story, so I'm not going to go into detail. But I think that um, I really want to honour you because you've done something that I haven't seen anywhere else. I don't know if it's happening anywhere else, but so far I haven't seen in this tradition in Europe, which is to build that home um, where people can um, just come and, and find their solidity to be part of this Sangha in Europe. Yeah. Renika, would you like to share a little bit about the joy of creating the colors of Compassion Sangha? Joy and colours of compassion are synonymous because um, we practice in the um, spirit of honouring our ancestors. And if you have Together We Are One, you'll book, you'll see that um, in that book, there's many stories of people um, um, who are not white sharing their stories of um, healing from the hurts of, of the oppression, of the racial oppressions. And... Um, you know, this is 52% of the population we're talking about. So it's, it's, it was really honourable to know that things, that we could have voices, we could have that voice, and um, also practice in the spirit of honouring and respecting our own root tradition alongside this tradition. And um, it had many meanings, and it's very 
eclectic. It's not just one homogenous group. So we have very many cultures and richness and times of celebrating um, our own practices alongside um, Thai's practices. Um, so it's, very, it's been very joyful to have the retreats that we did have in the UK, led by um, Kyra Jewell. Um, we had three of those. It was filled out. And I do believe that when the first um, P BIPOC POC retreat happened, um, there was that was filled out to about 500 people um, in the US. And it was all... Um, approved, I guess, by Thai. He, he really supported this practice. He supported these um, retreats. He saw the, um, the amount of um, healing that was taking place. Yeah. Thank you so much, Renika, Jassy, and Lisa. So we hope that uh, this very brief testimony um, can also inspire many of us in our local sanghas to really see how we can support and empower uh, the non-white members in our sanghas to have safe spaces, uh, to really ask how we can be of support, how we can trust and entrust so that those spaces can take place. And we hope here in Plum Village to be able to create more such spaces for people of color so that we really have the representation, the diversity that is reflective of the world. And so all of us can also, and especially those of us who have been socialized as white or present as white, that we have a chance also to look deeply and to really practice non-discrimination, compassion, and generosity from a re real place of deep understanding um, of racial inequity in the world. And that's part of our path as Thai students. And for me, when we speak about this as a community, I feel we're really honoring the legacy of Thai's friendship with Dr. Martin Luther King. So if we see ourselves as Thai student, this is also part of our work to do and to support. So thank you so much to our wonderful sofa here present. And uh, we, heard the, we heard the dinner bell. <laughs> But if, uh, if you would like to return to your seats, I would just like to introduce to you Uli, uh, Annika, and uh, Dorote, if you're still here, Dorote. Yes, please just come up briefly, and I would just like to, to introduce you. We wanted to show also the future of Plum Village and many of the directions where Thai's work is going. So we have Annika representing the international wake-up community. Dorote representing our happy farms, uh, which are our organic vegetable farms uh, that Thai insisted we should start developing here in Plum Village. And Uli uh, from Germany representing our earth holder community uh, and Thai's teachings to bring uh, love, uh, peace and healing to the earth. So I wonder if I can give you each one minute with the microphone, <laughs> and then we promise we'll go and serve our dinner. Uh, so, Annika, a few lines. Um, dear Thai, dear Sangha, one minute. <laughs> well, maybe what I can say is that um, I'm probably not representing Wake Up. Um, I can only... Um, I'm happy to coordinate for Wake Up and to see that it's growing and flourishing, um, that the pandemic has uh, given rise to even more um, the river growing or becoming even stronger and Wake Up Sanghas all over the world opening their doors to just everyone instead of just functioning locally. Um, I've seen Lian in many <laughs> online meetings, so it's now he's sitting here as an aspirant and um, is so engaged also with Extinction Rebellion and I think um, uh, showing very beautifully the, the spirit of wake up of young people who are happy to find belonging in a, uh, and, and empowerment through mindfulness, through the practice. Um, yeah, who find a home in the practice as well as like-minded people who want to work and engage for a better world. And I'm deeply grateful to Thai and the Sangha for um, having given rise to that. And um, it's an honor to support this movement. And I'm sad to grow out of it soon. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you, Annika. So Thai started the Wake Up Movement in 2008 in a summer retreat. I wonder, was anyone here in that summer retreat in that moment? So you may remember this funny moment when Thai insisted that some of us stand up and announce the creation of young Buddhists and non-Buddhists for a healthy and compassionate society. And I had to say this so many times, and then I had to read out this announcement and say, the YBHCS, <laughs> which doesn't have the same ring to it as the YMCA. But <laughs> so, so then we came up with the phrase, uh, the wake up movement, and Thai was inspired to do this as we heard from Sister Dinyam yesterday, because Thai had been working with young people since the beginning of his career as a monk. And he knew that um, young people can practice meditation, young people can practice mindfulness, and that the aspiration of young people to be of service in the world, when supported by a mindfulness practice, can really help young people serve as a community, as a collective. And he did that in Vietnam with the School of Youth for Social Service and was experimenting with the Wake Up Movement here in the West to see how young people can practice together to be seeds of change in the world. So thank you, Annika. And we have also Jazz in the Upper Hamlet, who on a volunteer basis have been supporting this incredible network of young people. And we're so grateful to you, Annika, for that. And for Dorothée, so a couple of years after starting the Wake Up Movement, I wanted to see how we can have more young people in Plum Village. And with the brothers, he had the idea to create vegetable farms so that we can really come and have time healing with the earth, our hands in the soil, nurturing the seeds in the land. So Dorothée, one minute about the happy farms. <laughs> Thank you, sister. Um, dear Hall, um, I don't know really how to start. Um, of course, Plum Village doesn't wait the happy farm to manifest, to grow uh, food and to uh, garden. Uh, but I think we are also helping with the happy farm, the monastic community who doesn't have the time as a gardener to <laughs> spend so much time in the garden. Um, so that's also one of the aspects of the happy farm who started in her Hamlet in 2012. And I did my first retreat in 2013 and I fall in love with the practice and with the project of the Happy Farm. I think at that time I see my first uh, eggplant uh, plant, <laughs> aubergine plant, and I was so amazed and so amazed about yeah what, what they share about this project. It was not uh, obviously only about growing food, uh, but it's also um, yeah the link with all the, the metaphor that we can find in Thai teaching uh, with the seeds and with... Um, yeah, growing, um, nourishing uh, uh, ourselves, and all yeah, all the metaphors about uh, nature that we can find uh, on his teaching. Uh, we try to um, to be with those teaching in the garden. I often uh, uh, tell myself that the the happy happy farm is my meditation hall because sometimes I miss uh, some of the of the activity with the sangha because yeah, May and June are really um, busy at the garden and I, I really enjoy uh, just knowing that so the Sangha also is practicing and I'm, I'm practicing um, in the Happy Farm. Um, yeah, it's also a, a place for uh, transmitting and to inspire of, um, yeah, from where come the food and maybe we can all start uh, uh, growing our own food uh, uh, in any scale. And yeah, that's for me so uh, important and inspiring. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothée. And what I, f I find fascinating is how Thai was still experimenting with what a healthy community looks like. And a healthy community grows its own vegetables in mindfulness. And a healthy community uh, is a place where young people can come and touch peace and touch meaning. And I feel also that with the Wake Up Movement and the Happy Farm, Tai was also seeing what he can offer the young generation who will face so many challenges ahead in the coming decades. What are the skills, the, the physical skills, but also the inner resilience and learnings that the young generations will need to survive the challenges ahead. So I feel it's a great gift that we're experimenting with in the Wake Up Movement and with our happy farms. So thank you both. And Uli, this is connected also to Thai's teachings on the earth. Uh, 
and uh, Tai um, gave so many teachings on the earth. I have, we'll just show some of the books that we, we may recognize. The first one was called The World We Have, where Tai really started raising the alarm bell. He described the climate crisis as a bell of mindfulness in this book. And then Tai went further and said, we need to fall in love with the earth. And some of us may remember these teachings in 2011, 2012, and they became the book, Love Letters to the Earth. And then more recently, and the teachings that Tai gave to young people have become this book, Zen and the Art of Saving the Planet, where we also have all of Tai's teachings on engaged action and ecology and uh, Tai's vision for how the young generation can protect our world. So, Uli, what would you like to share about the Earth Holder community? First, I want to share that uh, I'm reading this book. You mentioned uh, la the last, and it's not only from Thai, it's also from Sister Two Dedication. <laughs> <laughs> she, she writes many uh, interesting parts in this book. It's very inspiring. Um, one um, motivation to uh, leave my beloved uh, teacher in the Japanese Zen tradition was that I could not uh, combine this uh, experience. Can you just rotate the angle? So, so like this, like, like this, this and, yeah. like this. I could not uh, combine uh, this meditation practice with my political activism. I could not share it with my family and I could not share it with my students in the university. Um, and I was a political activist since I started with my studies, but I was motivated uh, by hate, by fear, and um, also filled with despair. And to encounter Thai's teachings about activism in a different uh, kind, it inspired me a lot. Uh, being active out of love, being active uh, and at the same time caring for yourself, being active and uh, not opposing someone, not uh, mm, uh, say you are guilty and I'm right. No, we are in the same boat and the ones who uh, make the coal mines in Australia, I'm fighting, uh, they are in me. And this is uh, the poem uh, of Thai, Call Me By My True Names, is the poem for every activist. Uh, you, you have no uh, opponent, the opponent is in your heart. And this is a very, very deep teaching, and I'm so grateful to have this teacher and to have a community uh, that shares this uh, concern for Mother Earth. Thank you. Thank you, Uli. So if you haven't yet heard about the Earth Holder Sangha or the Gardien de la Terre here in France, they have a wonderful website full of resources. And we're just starting in the last couple of years to develop earth holder groups here on in Europe, and there are many already in America. And they do a lot of online activities, which are wonderful to join discussions, presentations, and study, study groups. And it's a wonderful way to express our love for the earth, as Tai has encouraged us to do. So. <laughs> Voila, we arrive somewhere through some kind of arc. We've had a beautiful uh, journey uh, and we arrive uh, to activism, engagement and love for the earth. Thank you uh, for being up here, our final cushion sofa uh, group. Uh, you can return to your seats. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for your patience and generous mm -hmm. listening. We've had a journey along the river of the Sangha. Uh, I hope you have felt the spirit of community that shines through the people that really make the Sangha. And uh, of course, there are so many ways to tell the story of Plum Village. Maybe as many people as have experienced Plum Village, that's how many stories there are. <laughs> so we're just presenting a, a brief glimpse of flavor of the arc of growth uh, and especially as told by those who've practiced here in the lower hamlet 
So we will enjoy listening to three sounds of the bell to close our session. Thank you so much. We can enjoy feeling, feeling connected to one another and feeling enriched by everything we've heard as we enjoy these sounds of the bell. Thank you.